Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. It's Eclipse Day. And it's happening now, all throughout the duration of this show. Unless you're listening to this as a podcast sometime after the 3 p.m. hour on April 8th, 2024. What are you doing listening to your radio? Go outside and experience the eclipse in real time. I know. Actually, we've timed this live show to correspond sonically with the events of the eclipse as they happened. Sort of like Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon and The Wizard of Oz. Just kidding. But don't think I didn't think about how to make something like that happen. <laughs> the 413, while well, fabulous, is not in the path of totality, which means it's not safe to look at the sun without appropriate eyewear. I sure hope the gas station eclipse glasses I bought are legit. In honor of today's last solar eclipse in the continental U.S. until 2044 and the last one in New England until 2079, we're going eclipse crazy. Greenfield-based podcasters Lindsay Patterson and Marshall Escamilla from the Tumble Science Podcast for Kids will tell us all the incredible factoids they've learned about eclipses on a recent episode of the podcast. And we'll hear the eclipse song that they created for this special day. It's good to have an eclipse song besides Total Eclipse of the Heart. But what a song. And with local connections. Which we will certainly discuss later in the show. We'll have a special Monday appearance of the word nerd Emily Brewster, senior editor at Merriam-Webster, our dictionary in Springfield, who will share some fascinating eclipse-related words. But it's Monday, and Mondays are when we talk with our resident astronomer. No better a Monday to talk astronomy than today. Imagine being in like the 1500s or any other time previous to that and an eclipse happened. No wonder people would like fall on the ground and worship a god. You would think God is really mad at you if all of a sudden the sun shut off in the middle of the day. Not just that. I mean, there were so there are all of these. They're called sort of like you know the war eclipses or like you know death of a king because yeah. they would always find oh something something bad happened. Wait a minute, but there was just an eclipse. Yeah, we'll blame or it on the, the following. Blame it on the eclipse. Uh, Don't but, let the eclipse be an excuse to go do something <laughs> terrible either, by the way. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Time for some more kitchen table astronomy at the Amherst Kitchen Table of Hampshire College astronomer, Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe. Apart from all of these uh, things, eclipses are really crucial for science as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, one of the eclipses in 1868, in October, and this eclipse, uh, there was a French astronomer who went to India to observe it. And the reason for that was that a few years before that, astronomers had started to use spectrographs, meaning to say they had figured out a technique to look at the light from stars and from the sun and to figure out what elements it might be made up of. But if you really wanted to see around the sun, you needed it to be blocked. And there was an eclipse happening in 1868, and this a French astronomer, Jensen, he actually went to India and one of the locations, well, I guess it was a colonial India at that time, so yeah. the British were ruling. But anyway, the French astronomer went over there and he detected a particular type of element in the corona of the sun. So again, when all of the sun is blocked by the moon, you see a little light, a halo around the sun. This is called corona. And actually, it is really mysterious because it is that gas we now know today, it's about a million degrees, whereas the surface of the sun, and there is no surface, but the stuff that we see, it's around 5,500 degrees. So we think it has to do with magnetic fields and the sun and so on and so forth, but it's still a really fascinating mystery. But during the eclipse, you can actually see this halo around the sun. And you, that's, so when you were asking what you should see yeah. during the total eclipse, well, this is the other thing that you should see. And he used this spectrograph to look at, the, 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 it analyzed the light from those gases around the sun. And he found this line, which people thought that used to be like, you know, that maybe it's sodium and something like that, but actually no. When he actually took careful observations in 1868, he found that actually it didn't match any of the known elements that were known at the time by science. Uh -huh. And that element, Monty, was helium. And hence the name Helio, from Helios, the sun, because they thought, well, it's only in the sun. And uh, this was a major discovery uh, at the time. He didn't know, but actually there was an English astronomer, Lockyer, who actually had done separate observations a little after that. And he actually used blocking the sun and things like that. And he actually also detected helium. And but he detected it in balloons at a child's party. <laughs> he was sucking them in and then his voice would change. He was 
Sucking them in and then his voice would change. But I should mention that both of their papers arrived at the French Academy of Sciences on the same day. <laughs> And, and today they are both uh, jointly credited with the discovery of helium, but most scientists did not believe that this was correct because, hey, an, uh, suddenly a new element which is not found on Earth and it's only uh, in the sun. However, 30 years later, uh, they found actually gas here uh, around in one of the observations, and that was the confirmation of that. They both got gold medal in 1895 by the French government, so that's amazing. But even this is not the ultimate story of the eclipse because one of the most famous eclipses happened in 1919. And that is because, it's not because of the eclipse that it's famous, but because that particular eclipse provided the confirmation for Einstein's general theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because Einstein had just presented his theory in 1915. I mean, he had been working on it before as well, but in 1915 and 1916, he actually presented general theory of relativity. The basic idea behind that is that anything with mass, like the sun or galaxies or whatever, their mass bends space and time. Yeah. And so gravity in some sense is this curvature of space time. Einstein knew the implications of that. And this was all theoretical. So he had just done all the math and he had done that. But where is the test? Mm -hmm. And one of the ways he had thought about was that if during an eclipse, you, and during an eclipse, the other thing you see are stars. He thought stars that will be behind the sun, which during the daylight you won't be able to see, but during the eclipse, suddenly they would come into view. Their light, when it passes, the light of those stars, when it passes close to the sun, it would get bent. And so they will appear a little bit shifted than they are expected to be. It's just like if, if, you, if you look at, for example, uh, uh, bent, sort of like, you know, stick bent in a pool or whatever. That's another way of thinking about it. A straw in a water or whatever. It feels, it feels bent. So it's the same way it would act as a lens a little bit. So you would expect those stars to be moved away where they are. And this is a very cool prediction, although Newton's laws also, Newton's gravitation also predicted some of the bending, not because of the bending of space light, but because of force of gravity, he thought that light may get bent a little bit, but not as much as Einstein's theory of general relativity. Mm -hmm. And one of the astronomers led the expedition, uh, is a famous astronomer, Eddington, uh, he was a British astronomer. In 1919, they knew... He loves marmalade. What's cooking? Marmalade, Mr. Brown. Go on, have a taste. Oh, well, that's Paddington, <laughs> right, sorry. Actually, there's an interesting story about Eddington as well, because he was a Quaker. He didn't want to fight in World War I. He, had, he was a conscientious objector. He was a British uh, scientist. And they were like, ah, no, I don't think so. But one of the other royal astronomers, he actually argued that, well, he should be given an extension and maybe... This was in, 18, in, in 1918. War was still going on. He says, well, because there is an eclipse coming in 1919, and he will lead an expedition for that. Mm -hmm. And for this eclipse, they went to, there were two uh, places they went. One was in Brazil, and one was um, uh, on an island off the coast of West Africa. And uh, Eddington went uh, uh, to the island of the coast of uh, West Africa, and the whole point was to check if Einstein's theory of general relativity works or not. It is a crazy thing to do. And if you think about it, that, you know, that purely from mathematics, you get a prediction that during the eclipse, you will not find stars in the same place as you expect, but a little bit farther off. And at that time, there is a cluster in Hades in the constellation Taurus. There was a bunch of stars because there was a cluster of stars. And so it wasn't just one star. They could actually measure a couple of stars to do that. And that is what they found. It was, there's a there are fascinating books about this particular expedition because uh, it was cloudy, but it got cleared up right at the last minute. <laughs> they quickly did the observations and so on and so forth. And, and, and in fact, the, it made Einstein a star, even though, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> but even though Einstein was famous at that time, but not as famous after the 1919 eclipse. It was the front page story in many places. Also because this expedition had challenges because of the, we were waiting for the war to end and war did end. 
And that's when this, uh, this observations happen. But there was another element to it because Einstein, because of his German connections, he actually had presented his results in Berlin in 1915. Mm-hmm. And in 1919, he was a British astronomer who was doing experiments, who was doing testing of a theory presented by or calculated by Einstein, who was a German Mm -hmm. uh, scientist in that sense. So there was a lot of symbolic aspects as well. And so 1919 eclipse, that was amazing. Are there any things that we think we might learn from this 2024 eclipse scientifically? Are there going to be things that scientists are going to be trying to do that they'll only be able to do because there is a total eclipse happening? I think these studies of uh, the corona, I think that is still really like crucial. Like to see why it makes us sick and if the vaccine actually <laughs> is a hoax. Okay. No, oh, not that corona, I get it. But yeah, so no, I think those steps there, there are opportunities for citizen science as well. And I think, yeah, I think just enjoy it. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity, maybe. And if you're thinking about science, just think about it, how accurately we can predict these it's things. Crazy. I mean, in, in, in the hundreds of years, we, we are talking about in seconds, right? Like, you know, and so just appreciate. So you are asking, hey, what can we do? Well, appreciate science. Science, I mean, like, you know, there are a lot of uncertainties and all of those things, but there are things that we really know. And just imagine this prediction of Einstein's theory of relativity how precisely it was like, well, if there will be stars behind it, it will get bent the light from those stars during an eclipse, during those couple of minutes. And then scientists go and measure it and they go like, aha, that's exactly like, by the way, just close on uh, Eddington because uh, he was funny. He was actually interesting. He also wrote uh, a poetry. And so he actually, after coming back from the eclipse in 1919, he even wrote a short poem uh, parodying Umar Khayyam, his Rubaiyat, a you know, particular style of poetry. And he said, Oh, leave the wise our measures to collate. One thing at least is certain, light has weight. One thing is certain, and the rest debate. Light rays, when near the sun, do not go straight. So, Eddington is also doing poetry. Emily Dickinson is doing poetry. I know there are, I mean, this is one of those things that if you see, if you are close to the eclipse, you are going to be moved. Coming up later in the show, looking for an eclipse resource for your kids or for a still fun, loving and curious grown up, you know, we'll talk with Greenfield based podcasters, Lindsay Patterson and Marshall Escamilla from the Tumble Science Podcast for Kids, who will introduce us to their eclipse expert and will share with us the original eclipse song that they created for this special day. I don't think we'll be able to resist talking about Bonnie Tyler's eclipse song. Me either. And you've seen the literal video version of the total of eclipse of the heart. Oh, yes. <laughs> Slow mo <duh. laughs> <laughs> and ninjas. But up next, Emily Brewster, senior editor at Merriam-Webster, our dictionary in Springfield, will share some fascinating eclipse-related words, including the totally sad, depressing etymology of the word eclipse itself. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. A very special word nerd segment this Eclipse Day with Emily Brewster, our resident wordster from Merriam-Webster in Springfield, currently in the path of totality in Montreal. Ooh. We are going to talk about some eclipse words, Emily Brewster. So do tell what the dictionary has to shine a shadow on about the words of the eclipse. I think that the eclipse is, in, in some ways, it's really more about the moon than it is about the sun. Well, I guess it depends if it's a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, but either way, they both have to do with the sun and the moon. Yes. More directly yes. In, on the earth, with the earth, it has to do with the moon because the moon is, is closer to us than the sun, obviously. Yes. And the reason that we have an eclipse is because of the moon's position. Right. So I have some words that have to do with the moon. This one, <laughs> selenography. Ooh, Do you know this one? Ooh, no. No. Is Selenography it? is uh, it's the science of the physical features of the moon and its geography. Wow. Sea yeah. Of, sea wow. of tranquility? That's that's among, yes. If you study the Sea of Tranquility, you are studying the selenography. Yeah. Because, okay, it comes so, from yeah. Selena. <laughs> I could fall in love. 
the uh, in uh. Greek and Roman, she was the personification of the moon as a goddess. Oh. Yeah. Parents were Titans, and uh, her siblings were Helios, the god of the sun, mm. and Eos, the goddess of dawn. I love that they had a distinction between, like, dawn was its own, uh, had its own being, its own personification. Yeah. Mm. That's really nice. Is there one of Twilight, too? Or is she just, is she kind of all-encompassing of those liminal times? I don't know. And if there was, she was not a sibling of Selena, apparently. Alas. Don't throw away my love. So All right. selenography as opposed to geography and geology, right? Right. Mm. Selenography. I love it. If you can spy the man in the moon, you are, you are doing some selenography as you see the man in the moon. The man in the moon, that phrase dates all the way back to Middle English. Mon in the moan is Whoa. what they would say. Isn't that wild? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, they've been talking about the man in the moon for a very, very long time. Why did they say it like that? Because uh, they spoke Middle English. Okay, I got you. <laughs> but it still meant the exact same thing. It's not like we accidentally translated it wrong into man in, in the moon. No, 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 no. Was, I mean, pronunciation has changed tremendously. You yes. know that from the Shakespeare that you know, mm -hmm. right? Even pronunciation is is very, very different than it used to be. We used to pronounce the, you know, those GHs in words like laugh, for example, and laugh. Yeah. How, yeah, how would you say laugh in, with the Middle English? Ah, uh, I am not an Lag. expert on Middle English, but that GH would have been pronounced with that ugh sound that is in German, like in the word ich, meaning I. Oh, yeah. Ich bin ein Berliner. Yeah. I don't know what the AU did. I don't even know if the AU was there in Middle English. I don't have to look it up. But also a word like caught would be caught. You know, it would... Are you trying to make me no. sound ridiculous on the radio? Yeah, I just wanted to... It's like, you know, a, a checkup. <laughs> got a cough for me a little bit. So. All right, all right. You got to find another. You got to find another another word nerd for that. Mare is a very obscure but important word when we are considering the moon. Does it have to do with the sea? Yeah, it does. And we have it the sea does. of tranquility, as we all uh, already mentioned in the selenography of the moon. <laughs> so why does mare have to do with the moon? Mare is um, one of the dark, flat areas that appear on the surface of the moon. So the man in the moon is there. We only see the man in the moon because of a mare. Mare is singular. Maria is the plural or mar mares, M-A-R-E-S. I'm officially is declaring the him the woman in the moon. And we're gonna call him Maria from now on. I mean, we haven't <laughs> talked about the rabbit in the moon either. We well, haven't noticed the rabbit in the moon. The rabbit is is how you refer to the man in the moon often in Asian culture. You they talk about the rabbit in the moon wow. as opposed to the man in the moon. It's like Ooh, nice. now it's like Donnie Darko scary for me. Pay close attention. You could miss something. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so more about Mare and Maria and those dark spots on the moon. We're thinking of them as seas, I imagine. Yes, the idea that these are that these dark areas might be seas goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks, Plutarch apparently, and then Galileo introduced the concept again in modern times, but he never described them using the Latin word. Galileo then noted again that these were these flat dark areas and people thought that they were that they were seas, that they were there was water there and of course there is not. What we know now is that these are old basins that have congealed lava flows. I mean I didn't really know that until just now. But um congealed lava flows and that's why we have these dark spots. It's wild to think about the moon as having lava, but it did. Yeah, it's interesting. I also love that the moon is kind of Earth's baby, that likely a comet hit us and it shot the moon off into our orbit and then it coalesced into its spherical shape and is now the moon as we know it. And we every were, eclipse right? is just the moon going, no, no, look at me. Yeah, pay attention to me. Exactly. And where Apollo 11 landed was the Mare Tranquillitatis, Sea of Tranquility. Do you have other oh, eclipse oh, words for us, Emily Brewster, on this eclipse day? This one is very modern. Mask on. Ooh. Mask on. Like is... you have to put a mask on to look at the eclipse without <laughs> burning your eyes out? No, no, no. It's any of the high density regions below the surface of Lunar Maria, that's the plural. And what they do is they, we only know that they exist because they mess up the motion of spacecraft that are in lunar orbit. They have excessive gravitational attraction. Ooh. 
Whoa. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. So, the so there are these weird spots. anomalies, like dips or accelerations that occur when there are lunar orbiters and they're called mass cons. It's a contraction of the word mass concentration. So M-A-S-C-O-N? M-A-S-C-O-N. Mass con. Cool. Mass yeah. con. It right? sounds like a convention of people I, who love so Massachusetts. I was going to say that. Yes. <laughs> that thing is big, Jay. What is that thing? It looks hurt. And instead, it's this thing that happens. I wonder what they thought of it at first. Right? They must have been so puzzled. And then they decided that they knew what it was and that it had to do with, with um, ex- excess gravitational attraction. I wonder if any of the rovers, the um, landers currently on the moon are going to do anything, find out more information about them, or if it would be hard because of the increased gravity and their instrumentation. Right. I wonder if they get stuck when they go over them. Yeah. Yeah. And if we go back to the moon, you don't want to go play on a mass con. You want to go to the place where the gravity is less so that you can jump wicked high. No, there's too many people there. You'll catch something. Okay. (laughs) There are people on the moon. (laughs) There will be again eventually. Yeah. Very shortly, I think. Then they can wave at us when there's an eclipse like today, and we'll be like, hey, there they are. <laughs> now there are men on the moon. We won't be able to see the moon, though. We would just see a big black dot with a corona around it. So Yes, but we will know that they're up there. We'll know that they're up there. <laughs> they're yeah. up there. Right. Except uh, the, for those that handful of people who in, will inevitably deny it and say that it's fake. Yeah. Any more fun eclipse-related words, word nerd? Emily Brewster, resident wordster from Merriam-Webster? The word rill, R-I-L-L. It can refer to a very small brook or to any of several long, narrow, meandering valleys or trenches that are devoid of water on the moon's surface. Calling them a brook is, is really pretty absurd. Mm-hmm. But again, this has to do with what was what was understood previously and what is understood now. But this word rill, it's related to the word rivulet, and uh, it's been in English since the 16th century. And um, we've been paying such close attention to the moon for a very long time and making all kinds of mistaken assumptions about what it consists of. Cheese. <laughs> no. <laughs> I still wish. That would Sometimes be I look at the moon and I think, I bet it's delicious. No. Full of minerals. Very good for you. Yeah. Sort of. And there is Except wa- for the radiation. There is water on the moon. It's just not running in rivers. It's probably frozen on the poles and it's also under the surface in, you know, minuscule amounts. That's a big reason why people are going up there again. Right. But it's right. There are no rivulets. There are no there are no rivers. There's no flowing, flowing streams. Until the Kwisatz Sadarak comes up there and restores an ecosystem to that planet and becomes a sandworm himself. This is the boy I told you about. Furman speak of the Lasan al Oh, sorry. That's Dune. Not, <laughs> not the moon. Let's close on the word eclipse itself, Emily Brewster, on this eclipse day. What's fun about the word eclipse? It's actually a little bit sad. What, oh, what no. is, well, it's, what's interesting about the word eclipse. The word eclipse has been in English since the 13th century. It comes ultimately from the Greek word e with a little accent over it, K-L-E-I-P-S-I-S. That word is glossed as abandonment failure, cessation, obscuring of a celestial body by another. Wow. That that tracks. <laughs> that's for everybody that's A in here in Western Mass, it's not going to get the f- total solar eclipse. That's you. It's a failure. Two, it's a, if you're somewhere where you are in the path of totality and it's cloudy and you don't get to see it, also a sad sad failure. But if you are seeing the eclipse, what you are seeing in, you know, etymologically is the abandonment of light. Yep. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Now I'm depressed. I was all excited about today. <laughs> no, it's just like, I mean, it's beautiful because they're, it's so Greek to come up with like, the sun has left us. Yeah. <laughs> has left us entirely. What did we do wrong? You can imagine that's what people were rethinking. <laughs> if all of a sudden the sun shot off in the middle of the day. You're like, oh no. Thousands of years ago. We really messed up this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring out all Definitely. the goats. We're sacrificing them yeah. all we tonight. We better throw a baby in this volcano. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> On that extraordinarily <laughs> morbid note, thank you, Emily Brewster. <laughs> I wonder what they would call them before. <laughs> like, probably some other terms for abandonment. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? The sun is slowly fading in the western sky. Sometimes it takes forever the day to end.
Sometimes it takes a lifetime Sometimes I think I'll never see the sun again Emily Brewster will join us for her regular segment this Wednesday. Got a question for the Word Nerd? Email it to us at thefab413 at nepm.org. And a reminder, are you behind a desk in a windowless office listening to us live on the afternoon of Monday, April 8th? The eclipse is happening right now. Go check it out. But if you'd like some resources to help you or a young person you know, we'll keep exploring. Up next, from the Tumble Science Podcast for Kids, Greenfield's Lindsay Patterson and Marshall Escamilla on their recent eclipse episode, what interesting things they've learned about eclipses, and an original eclipse song. Plus a breakdown of the most famous eclipse song of all time. <laughs> You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by Northeast Solar, homegrown in Hatfield, Massachusetts, and providing energy savings for their customers for over 10 years. Learn more at northeast-solar.com. Tumble is a science podcast for kids and their grown-ups, as our friend Bill Childs from the radio show Spare the Rock, Spoil the Child likes to say. Lindsay Patterson and Marshall Escamilla host the show at their Greenfield, Massachusetts home from here in the fabulous 413. They ask questions, uncover mysteries, and share what science is all about. And we're going to talk about what everybody is talking about today and has been talking about, maybe ad nauseum, over the last uh, couple days and weeks, the eclipse. But I'll say that Lindsay developed Tumble Media, co-founded Kids Listen, an advocacy organization podcast for kids, created the first survey on kids' podcast listening habits, worked with Edison Research to develop and present their first ever kids' podcast listener report. And Marshall brings insight and perspective from his 17 years of classroom experience. Expertise in curriculum development informs Tumble Media's approach to developing educational audio for kids. He's also a composer, sound designer, and musician who brings that wonderful music to the Tumble Science Podcast. And they even have an Eclipse song in their Eclipse episode of Tumble, which is super fun. It doesn't have to do with poop or farts. That's my only critique of the song, because a lot of what you do talk about in the Science Podcast is poop and farts. And I thought, how am I going to work poop and farts into the eclipse talk? But now I've done it. You can check that box right off your your tumble bingo card. (laughs) Thanks for joining us on this eclipse day. Now, I'm going to fully disclose that uh, I wasn't going to say anything about this, but I'm going to say now that uh, we're not here. Kalisa and I were like, this is like potentially a once in a lifetime opportunity that a total solar eclipse is going to be within driving distance. Hopefully, we are right now in the path of totality somewhere in southern Vermont and we'll bring that information back to you about our experience on tomorrow's show. What are you, future Marshall and Lindsay in Greenfield, uh, going to be doing for the, for the total eclipse? Uh, we are heading up to Stowe, Vermont to go, uh-huh. um, well, observe the total eclipse. We're also meeting up with a bunch of old friends and spending a whole long weekend celebrating with our families and kids and stuff. Oh, I was going to say, we should carpool, but you already have a better <laughs> plan. We basically made this plan last minute, and we're like, we're just going to try to drive. We'll leave a couple hours early, and as long as we get somewhere where we're in the path of totality, we will experience the path of totality if it's not cloudy. So in your podcast, this particular Eclipse episode, and you've got podcasts about all sorts of great science topics, you talk to a, an Eclipse expert named Vivian White, I'll tell you what I learned that I thought was so much fun about eclipses from your episode, which is why they're so rare. Because scientifically, they happen, what, twice a year? Is that what Vivian said in the podcast? So you'd think, what's the big deal? They happen twice a year. But do you remember what her answer was as to why uh, we don't get to see them all that often if they happen twice a year? Yes. Well, at this point in our eclipse news cycle, you probably know that there is a narrow band called the Path of Totality, where it's only a thin slice of the area gets to see a total eclipse as opposed to a partial eclipse. And then you've got to contend with the fact that Um, More than half of the Earth is covered in ocean, and it's really hard to get to places that may end up being that path of totality. So we make a a little bit of a joke about whales being able to see the eclipse. Um, It's called whale watching when they watch the (laughs) eclipse. I love that. (laughs) Yeah, if you had a plane or a helicopter or maybe a boat, you could probably go and see more of these eclipses more frequently. But we're not going to have an opportunity within driving distance uh, to see an eclipse like this for quite some time. 
What are some things that Vivian White taught you as science podcasters for kids about eclipses that w- was fun for you? Like that was that little tidbit was fun for me. I mean, one of the things that really blew my mind was just the history of, of eclipse observations all over the world. Societies recorded this unusual event. They were probably like, what is happening? We've got to write it down. They scrawl on some rocks, you know, a picture of what the eclipse looks like. So we can know that eclipses were important to civilizations going back, you know, thousands and thousands of years. But we don't know where or who was the first civilization to record evidence of an eclipse. So that's very, very much up for debate. But here in the U.S., you can see petroglyphs in Chaco Canyon in New Mexico, where uh, the Pueblo people recorded their observations of the eclipse. What about you, Marshall Escamilla, from Tumble Science Podcast for Kids? Was there something that you learned from Vivian White, your eclipse expert, on a, a recent episode of Tumble about the eclipse that stood out to you? I mean, I think the most crazy thing was when she really described what it's like to be there when you're in the path of totality and the moon completely blocks out the sun. And, uh, you know, she really goes into great length of describing exactly what that's like, and it just sounds extraordinary. I've never seen one in person before, so I'm very excited to see this one. Yeah, I think I thought that I had seen the one in 2017, but I didn't. It was a partial <laughs> eclipse, so it was to realize like, wow, this is a it's a hugely different experience to be in the path of totality versus seeing the partial eclipse. Um, yeah, my, my resident astronomer, Salman Hamid, has described it as a, the difference between uh, kissing and going all the way. I know you're a, some, a science podcast for kids, so you probably don't want to include that as a descriptor. That was but, not yeah. the analogy that we used. <laughs> no. Hopefully 0% of our audience knows what that's like. <laughs> it is a podcast for kids and they're grown-ups, so maybe not 0%. Yeah. I'm a part of your audience. That's we're true. Speaking, <laughs> we're speaking with Lindsay Patterson and Marshall Escamilla from Greenfield, who hosts the Tumble science podcast for kids. One of the things that's awesome about the Eclipse podcast in particular is you use the soundscapes that you design, Marshall, and to help people kind of imagine that they are experiencing the eclipse. Vivian, all of a sudden you look up and it's completely different. It is like twilight in every direction you see. And just where the sun was a moment ago that you couldn't see that was still too bright to look at with your eyes alone, you can at that one moment during an eclipse, look up and you see this inky black hole. What do you imagine that you will experience right when people are listening to this? You, you may be experiencing it right now. So I've been told that you need to prepare for the fact that your mind will understand what's going on, but your body is telling you to run and hide. <laughs> and that this is <laughs> that, you know, you're just waiting for the wrath of God to descend upon you as all of nature is destroyed. (laughs) So I think uh, I'm really curious about that experience and to see what it's like. I've I've honestly never witnessed anything like this, so I'm just so excited. What about you, Lindsay? I am just really excited to see the change and hear the change in nature, how, you know, the world around us responds to the event. Because, you know, like we have the intellectual knowledge that this is going to happen. But, you know, going back to history, like I love thinking about, you know, this just suddenly appearing on the planet. Nobody knows what's happening and still, you know, the birds and the insects are not clued in to what's going on. So it's going to be really interesting to uh, be out in nature and see how those natural patterns of life are disrupted. Well, it's amazing that they seem to step, I, I don't know yet, but I hope too soon, that the insects and birds and things step right into line. They're like, oh, I guess night came early today they don't they maybe there's some mild panic that'll be interesting to see if the animals start to panic they're just like well it's nighttime so i'm gonna cricket now or i'm gonna you know go back to my nest that'd be also interesting to to note too 
speaking with Marshall Escamilla and Lindsay Patterson from the Tumble Science Podcast. It's Eclipse Day. I'm very excited about this. I think anybody who loves science at all is excited about it. What are some of the other things that your listeners were excited to ask about the podcast? There was a great kind of Q&A section in the podcast. I know that there was a little bit more in the bonus, too, of uh, the Patreon behind the, the wall that uh, kids might have been interacting with the Eclipse. What were some of the things your listeners were excited to learn about? Well, one of the things that comes out a lot is why do we need to wear these special glasses to view the eclipse? And the answer is you can damage your eyes just by listening to the, uh, listening to the sun. So audio you don't focus. Li- you can listen to the sun all the day. You can listen day. to the sun without headphones even. But you can't look at the sun generally on a daily basis. But if you're in the path of totality, you can take your solar viewers off and really stare at where the sun should be for the first time ever if you haven't seen a total eclipse before. So that was something that we really wanted to make clear the distinction of it's okay to look at the sun if you're here for these very few moments, but then you have to put your solar viewers back on. Yeah, it's a rare opportunity, unless you have magic powers to just look at the sun. What are some of the upcoming topics that Tumble Science Podcast is going to be uncovering for kids? Oh, man. I mean, another uh, newsy event is the double cicada emergence. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that for people who are. I can't wait to cover this, too. But tell us about that. This is the first time we've talked about it on the show, I believe. But There's going to be so much bug screaming. <laughs> yeah. So at the beginning of spring, we expect to see two broods of cicada come out at the same time. And it's the first that these particular broods have emerged together since 1803 when Thomas Jefferson was president. So So what did I miss? What did I miss? It's sort of like a big reunion. There's cicadas that stay underground for 13 years before they emerge. And then there's cicadas that live underground for 17 years before they emerge. So there's this sort of convergence of the years when they come out and that's been it's taken about 221 years so for you that thought to happen. having to wait for the next eclipse was going to take a long time yeah <laughs> it'd be interesting yeah. to find out when the next time the cicadas the 13 and 17 years will come again but i'm sure yeah. we'll learn that from the tumble science podcast when that version when <laughs> that episode is out i don't, I don't yeah, think we talked about that but the, you know these particular broods one of them is a 13 year and one of them is a 17 year and they only correspond you know, the least common multiple between 13 and 17 is 200 something. Yeah. That's too much, <laughs> too much math for me. Is, so. it, is the least common multiple of them multiplied times each other? Yeah, 13 times numbers? 17 is the yeah. least common multiple of those two numbers because they're both primes. There you go. So, um, well done. Well done, math nerds. Hey, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Right here. Somehow I remembered all of those dates, but I was pretty nervous about them. But <laughs> yeah. There's, I mean, in the process of... Uh, reporting the story i learned so much cool science about cicadas so that's almost the least interesting thing about them they have like just all these like crazy things that they do in order to change their cycles and we found out that climate change might be changing the way that cicadas emerge Uh uh-oh that's not good news. We'll see what happens. Maybe it won't be uh, the prime numbers multiplied. It'll be something else eventually. Yeah, some 17-year cicadas are becoming 13-year cicadas. So oh, whoa. it's a bit of a change in identity. It's because kids these days have such short attention spans. Yeah, That's it's they, they gave the baby the cicadas face. TikTok, and they're all yep. posting. <laughs> That's it. Hey from underground, fam. <laughs> About to emerge. <laughs> Working on my little so, uh, digger leg right here soon this is going to be another just a normal leg once i emerge coming out to propagate the species y'all i got a new song coming out we're gonna sing we're singing cicadas my song goes (laughs) sounds like a sitar (laughs) sitar cada sitar (laughs) cada cicadas are delicious though when they come out 
this is the thing I mentioned to Lindsay that you can eat them, and I don't know yeah. that that made it into the show. Yeah, you can eat them. We had a group I was in at my college when we have reunions. The last time, it was uh, the one of the 17-year emergences in Ohio, and we did a whole banquet around cicadas. It was awesome. <laughs> wow, that's a great reunion activity. Let's yeah, get totally. the bugs. Yeah. That is the next big scientific topic, but we can't eat an eclipse. No. We can eat an eclair, but not an eclipse. <laughs> you can eat clams at an eclipse like I did in the 2017 eclipse at Captain Jack's Roadside Shack in East Hampton. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. Which is where we watched it from, and it was really fun. All right. But you can sing about an eclipse. Tell us what the inspiration was behind the Tumble Science Podcast eclipse song, Lindsay and Marshall. Sure. The main inspiration was Lindsay told me to write a song. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> I did write the, I wrote the lyrics. Marshall did the music. Um, so we basically co-wrote it. We've been doing more kids songs and it's been really fun. So we thought that, or let's say I thought that it would be a great occasion because uh, how many eclipse songs do you know besides Total Eclipse of the Heart? Well, that was... brings me to the next question. What is your take on Bonnie Tyler's hit written by Jim Steinman, Amherst College alum? Oh, Total Eclipse of that. the Heart. Yeah. yeah, he wrote a lot of very interesting musicals while on campus. Yeah. And also after, he did some collaborations with Andrew Lloyd Webber that are questionable. You can't eat meatloaf. Uh, what's your take on Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart? I love it. It's iconic. And this uh, working on the song made me go back, listen to it, and also enjoy the YouTube literal version oh my, of yes. Total Eclipse of the Heart. That, go it's online so and watch that. <laughs> it is, you need to know the music video or you know, watch it on YouTube. It won't be as funny on the radio, but watch that one. Staring at the slim team gets you killed by a gang of dancing ninja men who know how to twirl. And Aha's Take On Me. Have you seen that one? The literal video version of that? Oh, no. And Tears for Fears Head Over Heels. Yep. Now I'm singing in the library and trying to pledge. They're all good literal oh. videos on YouTube. Shameless plug. Yeah. Interesting. Marshall, you're a musician. What's your take on Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart? <laughs> And would you have liked it better if it had been done by Meatloaf as it was originally intended? It was, a, oh, I interesting. I think they had a falling out, and then he gave it to Bonnie Tyler instead. Wow. I couldn't I mean, see Meatloaf in that music video, which no. to me is the <laughs> yeah, to change the music video, the totally, yeah. yeah. I don't know. He could rock that dress. Yeah, maybe. I, I think it would still work. I think I, He I should think have been the private be school teacher. <laughs> Even <laughs> children. That does make Actually, more sense. I'm going to have to watch that video again. I've completely forgotten what happens. So it's, I, it's spooky. It's a spooky video. I mean, yeah, there's, there's all like, the, like, bright eyes. I, I know yeah, there's ninjas and, and, like, gauzy curtains and a lot of wind coming from nowhere and people running in halls. It's very intentionally lit, but, like, not in ways that are, uh, you know, Euclidean. Yeah. <laughs> there, don't forget the fencing match. Oh, oh yes, right. of course. Here's another shot of fencing. Wow, and we really have done a deep dive on Total Eclipse of the Heart here, which I'm, oh. I'm really feeling good about. <laughs> yeah. It is, it is the season, after all. Yes. Uh, Lindsay Patterson and Marshall Escamilla from Greenfield, Massachusetts, creators of the Tumble Science Podcast for Kids. They've got a really fun episode about the eclipse. So if you are experiencing the eclipse now, want to learn more about the science behind it, you can go with your kids to listen to it and hear from eclipse expert Vivian White. You can find out more about them at sciencepodcastforkids.com, where you could become a Patreon member and get even more bonus information about eclipses and more. And you can find the podcast wherever podcasts are available, as they say. Thank you both so much for shedding some uh, shadow or light on the eclipse for us. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. After the majesty of today's eclipse, I think we're going to start getting excited about the cicadas. We did the math on the cicada convergence. The last time the 13 and 17 year cicadas emerged at the same time, Jefferson was president. The next double cicada event is in the year 2245. I mean, genuinely, I don't envy anybody who lives in those states mm. where that's about to happen because their summers are going to be very, very noisy. Mm. 
Up next, we'll hear the original Eclipse song that Greenfield's Lindsay Patterson and Marshall Escamilla from the Tumble Science podcast created for this special day. And maybe a quick rundown of our other favorite Eclipse-related songs. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. Here is the original Eclipse song that Greenfield's Lindsay Patterson and Marshall Escamilla from the Tumble Science podcast created for this special day. Sun. When the lines between the sun, moon, and earth become one, it rarely comes our way. Where will you be when you can see totality? A total eclipse of the sun. La la la, a total eclipse of the sun. La la la, a total eclipse of the sun. A total eclipse is when the moon moves in front of the sun When the lines between the sun, moon and earth become one It's a special moment they say How lucky are we so amazing to see this reality A total eclipse of the sun La 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 A total eclipse of the sun La 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 Total eclipse of the sun La 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 A total eclipse of the sun Lindsay Patterson and Marshall Escamilla from the Tumble Science Podcast. You can check out all the fun science stuff the Greenfield-based podcast has to offer at sciencepodcastforkids.com. Uh, Khalees, we didn't want to tell anybody until just that last segment, but we, we are not here. No. This was your doing. I had thought about it at first, but you really... Um, well, the thing is, when the eclipse is not coming back to your neck of the woods within your lifetime. Unless we live to be 100 and or 101. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 100 for me, 101 for you. Yes. Then 2079. I, I feel like you should maybe make time to go see the thing that you will not have another chance to see easily, especially when it's such a cool thing and it is so close. So... <laughs> I really pushed that we could maybe be a part of the science that we talk about every week and actually see the eclipse. So if all went as planned when we were recording this on Friday afternoon, we have left this morning, Monday, at 6 a.m. to drive to New Haven. Vermont. Oh, but that's not the, what the pizza place is. No, sadly, no. Oh, no. Maybe no, they have w- New Haven pizza in New Haven, Vermont. But they, New Haven, I, I Vermont. Mean, I guess maybe, but I know they have sheep. Okay. Yeah, the, the pictures look <laughs> sheep nice. Sheep and trees. And it is in the path of totality. And it it's is. like, what is it? Like two minutes and 55 seconds of totality that has happened in this hour that we might we might have experienced. Yes. And I'm very much looking forward to it. I have screens for my phone and my eyes. And I can't imagine what all of the weird things that happen around us will be. This is a strange pin to put in a week that's already had a freak snowstorm, nor'easter, a earthquake out of nowhere, and then finishing off with a eclipse, a total solar eclipse. I'm a little worried, as I mentioned to my partner earlier last week, that Ryla is going to rise from the depths, and this is all signs and importance. I think I saw Marjorie Taylor Greene posting about the same thing, actually. Not, uh, there's what, no that way. It was, was a different god that Marjorie Taylor Greene was Yeah, I'm, I was going to say, like, there's no way that Marjorie Taylor Greene knows who Ryla is. Yeah. <laughs> who is Ryla? Oh, Ryla is uh, one of the elder gods who lives in the depths of the ocean in Lovecraftian lore. Um, if you're hearing this, this means that uh, we were not able to connect with the radio station to tell you how our experience was in the Path of Totality. But uh, we will be certain to tell you about it in an upcoming show. Indeed. We hope you did something special for the eclipse. We did. Or at least we tried to. Tomorrow on the show, given that April is National Poetry Month and given one of the nation's most famous poets is from the 413, we're taking the show on the road. Tuesday on the Fabulous 413, we are live from the Emily Dickinson Museum in Amherst. We'll get a glimpse of the restored evergreens and talk lines and stanzas with poets that have been involved with the museum over the years. Nicole Young-Martin, Erica charis Molling, and Abigail Chabanoy. Plus, talk about the work of the woman herself with the museum curators. 
Thanks to the tireless Fabulous 413 tech team. We'll see you tomorrow on the Fabulous 413.